I joined Arab to work on a major project and this is what I got. You know, there's not actually that many projects that we do that are run for as long and involve as many people. So, you know, this is the biggest I've done and it's probably the biggest I'll do for some time. I've got to say, it's, uh, it's one of the greatest projects that I've worked on. It's a sort of once in a career project. This is the story not of the construction of the Shard, but of the dedicated team of engineers, both men and women, who behind the scenes provided the Shard with a safe, comfortable environment, bringing this building to life. Although hundreds of engineers from all four corners of the world worked on this project, this team has been totally involved for the past decade. It's really exciting for me to be standing here in this completed a uh, fantastic building, just 12 years after I first started working on it. Arup provided the engineering support for all the planning submission on this building and here today we are standing in this incredible building uh, in this wonderful location. I'm standing right at the top of the Shard and as you can see we've provided a water supply and this is almost a thousand feet above ground level. So what journey did this water have to take to make it all the way up to this level? Water enters the building from the main in the street. It comes in and it fills these tanks. We then pump it with these 75 kilowatt domestic water pumps up to level 29, which is above the offices. From there, we store it and then we pump it again up to level 51. All the time on that journey, it supplies every part of the building with domestic water until ultimately we store it in a dedicated tank and pump set at level 67, which is purely to get water right to the very top of the building to feed that tap, which is on level 87, almost a thousand feet in the air. So why have we put all these pumps and tanks in this building? Why not pump it directly from the basement here all the way to the top of the shard in one go? The answer is pressure. If a column of water stands in a single pipe from the top of this building to the bottom, due to the weight of the water, the pipe at the bottom must withstand a pressure of 300 tonnes per square metre. That's the equivalent of me trying to hold a 4x4 in the palm of my hand. So my design includes tanks and pumps at various floors throughout the building, which effectively break the pressure down into smaller amounts. And ultimately, I have kept the pressures within the whole system down to levels found in your average height building. The secret of the energy efficiency of the shard lies in this incredible transparent facade. What it allows you is wonderful views of London uh, but also it lets daylight deep into the office building. Of course the challenge with this is how to keep the sun out when it shines. Many office buildings have dark facades or shiny facades to do just that, but in this project we have blinds which automatically come down when the sun is shining on that particular facade. This means that when the sun is not shining, we can have maximum transparency. Not only do we have to worry about keeping the sun out in the summer, we need to keep the building warm in winter. So this clever facade has three layers, a double layer here, and then a third layer of glass on the outside. This gives it good insulation and keeps the building warm during the winter months. One of the challenges for a building services engineer is to minimise the visual impact of what we do. We need to get air in and out of the building to maintain a comfortable environment and we need lots of equipment to move it around as well as to provide heat, cooling, water and electricity. But nobody wants to see these functional elements. Most buildings use the roof to conceal this equipment and air can be taken in and out using discrete facade locations that people are unlikely to see. But the Shard doesn't really have a flat roof, 
and at 300 metres tall, there doesn't appear to be many discrete facade locations. The solutions that we've developed for the shard are fundamental to the geometry of the building. Although called the shard, the building is actually made up of a number of shards that lean together to form the tapering geometry of the building. In between these shards are what the design team call the fractures, slivers of negative space that run the entire height of the building. The fractures are partially obscured where the shards sail past the floor plate, and this creates exactly the type of discrete location that we're after. If you look closely, you can see louvers in each fracture at the equipment floors, and this is where much of the ventilation air is brought into and exhausted from the building. This is how the shard breathes, but if you're not looking, you probably wouldn't even notice them. Although the majority of the equipment is located in the basement, some access to outside air is needed for the chimneys of the boilers that heat the building and to reject the heat from the chillers that cool the building. This is achieved by using the roof of the smaller rectangular 18 floor extension to the east of the shard, which has become affectionately known as the backpack by the project team. Because it's 18 floors high, it's really only visible from the neighbouring streets. The roof of the backpack houses all of the equipment that needs access to outside air, but the equipment itself is concealed by a louvered facade which allows air movement while shielding the equipment from view. The trouble with high-rise buildings is that so much of the floor plate is taken up by the lifts and stairs needed to get around the building. Space is also required for the pipes, cables and ducts that are used to move water, electricity and air around the building. My job is to make sure that these take up as little space as possible, so as to maximise the remaining space that can be rented to tenants. One of the ways that we've ensured an ultra-efficient use of space is by modelling all of these pipes, cables and ducts in three-dimensional drawing software. Because of this, the floor heights are also a lot lower than you would typically get in a tall building. ARP have benchmarked the shard against a number of similar sized towers around the world, and the structural and building services zone is over half a metre less than the average for each floor. Taking this saving across all of the occupied floors, the result is an additional 11 floors within the same planning envelope, which is of enormous commercial benefit to our client, the Seller Property Group. The Shard, as well as being the tallest building in Europe, is also a mixed-use building. At the base of the building are 25 floors of offices, and I'm stood on one of those office floors now, and you can see that it really is going to be an amazing place to come and work every day. Directly above that, we've got three levels of restaurants, and then above that is a luxury hotel. Then there's 13 floors of luxury apartments, and right at the top, is a viewing gallery where the public can go and enjoy some wonderful views out across London. So a good way of thinking about the Shard really is as five different buildings stacked one on top of the other. Between each of those different building types is a, a void floor and that floor is full of all the plant and equipment that serves the occupied floors. What we do as building services engineers is we design all the systems that fill those void floors and serve all the occupied spaces. So we design the systems that really bring the building to life. They make it a safe and comfortable, productive place in which to live and work. And of course we try and do that in the most energy efficient way possible. So here we are deep in the basement of the shard, in the boiler room. It's quite hot, it's quite noisy, and uh, I'm stood in front of the four gas-fired boilers. The installed capacity of the boilers is equivalent of about 400 domestic boilers, typical of what you'd have in your house. And uh, one of the interesting things about the Shard is that uh, because it's in such a dense urban environment, we've had to build it quite quickly and um, take into account all of the traffic and other issues surrounding the site. One of the things that we've done is brought in some of the bits of equipment already pre-assembled on prefabricated modules. And these are the black modules that you can see. The reason why we've done that is because they can be constructed off-site cheaper, more safely, and it also reduces the amount of operatives on-site, reducing the overall construction time. To give a few examples of the types of systems that we've designed, 
We have to ensure that enough fresh air is fed into the building to make it a pleasant environment. Just for the offices alone, there is enough air pumped in to fill a hot air balloon every 45 seconds. We design the systems to both generate and circulate water to heat and cool the building. We've designed the electrical power systems, taking a cable from the street of 20,000 volts and made sure that it is possible to plug in a computer, a light or a kettle anywhere in the building. We've made sure that even if there is a power cut from the cable on the street, it will still be possible to run the building. We've made sure that there is enough gas to feed the large boilers and for the kitchens. Then there are the toilets to consider, which as well as needing drainage, also need water, dedicated ventilation, lights and other electrical fittings. We've also designed the sprinkler system and a number of other systems to ensure the safety of the building. From the basement of the shard right the way to the top, the whole building is protected with sprinklers and those sprinklers are served by this pump which provides water to every single sprinkler head in the building. Uh, this is a multi-outlet pump and that means where typically you'd have one inlet and one outlet from a pump, this pump has seven outlets and that is because regulations in the UK and Europe dictate that in tall buildings, you must have separate height zones. This is for safety reasons, to prevent very high pressures from being delivered lower down the building. Each of these zones can be a maximum of 45 metres in height. That's approximately the height of 10 double-decker buses. So for a building as tall as the Shard, this means we have seven height zones. And therefore, seven outlets on the pump which makes this the first and only seven outlet sprinkler pump. Another first for the shard is the use of digital pressure sensors, which we call transducers. These are so that we can accurately monitor the pressures within the system. And these digital sensors will tell the pumps when to start and when to stop. If we had analog, traditional, mechanical sensors, they struggle under pressure and they are not very accurate. Therefore, the use of digital pressure sensors, we can be more accurate and more appropriate for a high-rise building such as the Shard. We have provided a wet riser system for the fire brigade to use to fight a fire. So what is a wet riser? In medium-rise buildings, regulations require us to provide what is called a dry riser. This is basically an empty pipe which runs from the ground level of the building to the top. The firemen can then drive up and plug their water supply from the fire engine into the bottom of the pipe and the fireman will have access to water at the top of the building. When it comes to high-rise buildings, the water supplied by the fire brigade engine does not have enough power to force water up through the building. So we have to provide a water tank, pumps and pipework already filled with water so the fireman can just plug his hose into it. This is called a wet riser. As the tallest building in Europe, the Shard is provided with a wet riser system which is totally unique. In the basement of the Shard, we have provided the largest commercial wet riser pumps in Europe. This pump delivers 4,500 litres a minute, which is a full bath of water every second. Pumps are also located on the 29th floor above the offices and the 51st floor above the hotel, and these are all effectively connected to the same pipe which runs from the basement to the very top of the shard. Imagine a fireman uses the lifts to get to the top of the shard and then draws water from the system. As the pumps are all connected to the same pipe, they must all work together in sequence, beginning with the ones in the basement, then the pumps located on floor 29 kick in, and finally, the pumps on the 51st floor take the water right to the top of the building. This sequence all happens in a matter of seconds. The incoming electrical supply to the Shard is approximately 10 megawatts. To put this into perspective, the estimated incoming supply to the City of London is roughly 1500 megawatts and the London Docklands is about 400 megawatts. Most commercial buildings in London have two incoming electrical supplies, so if one supply fails, the building can still operate on the second supply, ensuring the building can still function as intended. But the Shard actually has three incoming electrical supplies thus providing a system that is over and above what is typically provided. 
Should there be a disruption to the electricity supply in London, the Shard has standby generators that are capable of producing electricity that is roughly equal to a thousand average UK homes. The fire and life safety systems form a critical element of the Shard and roles at the forefront of the design process. In the event of an incident occurring, the building automatically enters a series of pre-programmed steps. These steps are called the cause and effect matrix. The matrix consists of approximately 275 different possible causes that produce over 1,650 different effects. For example, if someone smokes a cigarette in the shard, this activates the fire alarm system. This activation is the cause. The effect is what happens to the different systems in the shard due to the cause. For instance, the fractures that David talked about earlier, vents open to allow fresh air to enter the building. Another effect could be the lifts entering their evacuation mode. Over 60 miles of fire rated cabling has been installed in the shard to ensure that the building users are safe and the cause and effect matrix operate correctly, should it be called upon. All of the equipment is monitored and controlled from a central control room in the basement via multiple touchscreen televisions. In a normal building, you're advised not to use the lifts in an emergency, but as we've already seen, the shard is not a normal building. The shard's lifts are powered up and down through the use of large electrical motors, the biggest of which is about the size of a small family car. Now in operation these motors get warm and they need constant cooling to run without fault, but there's nothing strange about that. But remember, the shard's lifts need to run in emergency, so they need to run no matter what. Therefore, the cooling system that cools the lift motors must be extra resilient. For resilience, I've designed a completely standalone cooling system dedicated solely to the lifts and separate from the main system. The system is supplied by backup power and has two of every key piece of equipment, meaning if one fails there's always another one to stand in standby to tap in and take over. At the head of this system are the chillers which you see behind me. There are two of these, obviously, one to run and one to tag in should the first one fail. Now these need flat space, but as we know, flat roof space on a needle-shaped building is at a premium. So therefore, the chillers sit here at level 75, quite neatly near the top of the shard. At level 75, we're something like 250 metres above ground level, making these chillers possibly the tallest installed chillers in the UK, maybe even Europe. Now, the external conditions up here are likely to be pretty windy, so the chillers have been specially adapted to cope with these harsh conditions. All these things go together to make sure that the shards escape lifts run no matter what. The ability to operate in an emergency means that building occupants can be safely and quickly evacuated from the building, but it also means that firefighters can use the lifts. Another way that I've helped to ensure the shard works safely in an evacuation is in the lift and stair pressurisation system. In this system, large fans wider than I am tall are located at each of the equipment levels and they blow outside air into the lift shaft and escape stairs. This means that the lifts and stairs are always under positive air pressure, so when you open a stair or lift door, air comes rushing out. This in turn means that smoke is unable to enter these spaces and the building occupants can safely escape using the lifts and stairs at any time. Teamwork is very important, especially um, on a project like this. We've all got kind of quite detailed technical design to do, but it's all got to work together. So ultimately, if, if we're not working together, it doesn't matter how good our own individual pieces of design were, they just won't work. Teamwork is obviously key in a, in a, in a building as, as complex as this building. Teamwork becomes paramount, it becomes so important to work as a unit. I think it is a building to be proud to have worked on. It's one of those iconic buildings that you talk to people about what you do and most people know what the Shard is, they've seen it, they've seen it in the newspapers and to be part of that, part of that team that's actually made that vision come to life, I think that's quite special, yeah. I feel proud of being involved in it. It's been some hard, hard and trying times, but we've all come through it, and uh, it was good to come out the other side. One of the best things about this project, really, is that having worked on it for so long, you can see what you've drawn, what you've designed, and you, you can actually see it get built 
and go all the way through to the end and, and see those lines that you drew on a piece of paper actually turn into real life objects on a, on a building and on a job this size it just makes it even more special. Yeah I think one of the interesting things about London is that you can build buildings like this and still maintain those historical buildings so it's this interesting juxtaposition of old buildings and new buildings and I think young, London's quite unique in that sense. It makes you respect some of the people that are involved in buildings like St Paul's Cathedral because they were built hundreds of years ago without the sort of technology that we have. Well, I hope it's still here in 200 years time but um, I think they'll be, they'll be, I hope they're still impressed by what we've done more than anything. Um, we, there have been so many occasions on this project that we've gone further or done more than you would normally do or, you know, innovated and I hope that it's, it sort of marks a line in the sand as a sort of, yeah, that's the new standard and buildings forward take that on and that's, that becomes normal.